Hey, CW Apes, Mr. Kennedy here. We're going to do part two of our chapter nine notes on geologic processes, um, earth systems and resources. Um, so today we're going to look at geologic hazards. You can find these videos all on my YouTube channel. And remember, uh, copies of the PowerPoint are available from our class webpage. Don't forget to take down what you need in order to fill out that notes section so you're ready for your quizzes and tests. Okay, so geologic hazards. Uh, when you think about geologic hazards, I want you to think about any type of event that involves the earth, uh, the earth's crust, minerals, whatever you want to you know, call it, um, that can lead to um, risk or loss of life. Okay. So like I put a, just a short list here of a few things like asteroid impacts. I mean, they don't happen very often, but you know, the last one I remember led to the extinction of the dinosaurs. It's like, I can remember it like it was yesterday. I mean, man, it was so loud. Um, floods, floods take the greatest number of lives on a global scale. Um, while wind causes lots of property damage, our bread and butter here in California isn't floods, isn't wind, and it's not asteroid impacts. It's earthquakes. Anywhere you travel in the United States, they're, they're like, oh, you live in California? Like, wow, you're going to fall off into the ocean because, like, the state's going to break in half with an earthquake or something, right? Um, no, but that's what people think. Anyways, so yeah, we do have earthquakes in California. Um, our tectonic plates are slipping past each other in a place called the San Andreas Fault, which we're gonna explore in more depth and detail here in a second. Um, but yeah, that's the thing that everybody thinks is going on in California. Um, earthquakes themselves um, are basically, you know, dangerous and devastating when construction is poor, or when buildings are, are constructed along earthquake zones like the San Andreas Fault. Um, so we'll actually spend a lot of time in a state like California making sure that buildings are up to code and uh, that we have accurate maps of where earthquake faults are so that we don't inadvertently build on those faults and create risk for people who might inhabit those buildings. Probably the most seismically active region in the United States is the West Coast, is where we live. Um, although the largest earthquake ever recorded in the United States was in um, New Madrid, Missouri. Um, tsunamis can sometimes come with earthquakes. Uh, there's a video that we're going to watch about um, a, the killer quake in Japan where a magnitude 9 earthquake happened just off the coast of Japan and it generated a massive shock wave in the ocean that wreaked havoc on the mainland. Um, so Tsunamis will happen anytime earthquakes happen uh, under a body of water. To kind of give you a map of where earthquakes are common in the United States, uh, we're going to look at this, and you can see that west coast is all in red. Um, that's where we live, folks, and uh, that's where earthquakes are most common in the United States, and the probability of another earthquake is high within the next 50 years. When earthquakes happen, there's usually something that comes in the news that says, hey, this earthquake happened and it was this on the Richter scale and it was located like here. The epicenter was here. Um, the word epicenter is to describe the point at which the earthquake occurred on the surface. Um, the focus of the quake would be like underground where the actual plates were slipping past one another. Um, but no one ever really talks about that because people don't really relate to that well. They relate more to like the city that uh, was most near where the earthquake um, occurred. And usually when they talk about those cities, um, if uh, if the city where the earthquake occurred was some small little like, I don't know, hillbilly, um, you know, town, they're, they're not going to talk about the small little hillbilly town. They're going to talk about like the next major city nearby, like, I don't know, um, you know, L.A., OK, so um, that's usually what they do. OK, um, when you think about where earthquakes happen, earthquakes tend to happen mostly in subduction zones. Uh, remember, we learned about subduction zones in our last lecture. You have some place like uh, along the coast of the United States, which is right here. And uh, you've got like the Pacific plate, which is diving under the North American plate. And as it does so, right, um, every once in a while, there's a, a, a little slip or a catch as the North American plate buckles and pops over that Pacific plate. Um, so usually subduction zones lead to earthquakes, but that's not the only place. Um, our most famous uh, earthquake fault line is the San Andreas fault, and it's not a subduction zone. It's a transform fault where the plates are going side to side. Okay, so subduction zones common, but not the only place. 
Um, next thing to look at are the waves that are created by earthquakes. So there's terminology here. You're going to need it for lab too. Um, P waves are the primary waves. These are the first waves that travel through uh, the earth. Uh, they're called body waves. Um, and basically, uh, they travel really well through solid rock and liquid magma. You might feel a little bit of vibration in the ground when these things arrive. Um, S waves are the secondary waves. These are also body waves. Um, they move material up and down and can actually start that process of literally making the surface of the earth roll. Okay. Um, they can't travel well through liquid magma. Surface waves are the ones that really do all the damage. Okay. Um, you have love waves and rally waves. The love waves move the ground from side to side. That's where the real hard shaking comes from. And then the rally waves, like literally, that's where the roll in the ground comes from. I've seen it firsthand. I was a little kid living back in Bakersfield uh, years ago. Um, there was an earthquake that literally threw about half the water out of my swimming pool. And I was sitting there talking on the phone and I literally watched the ground in my house like roll like that. It was crazy. Uh, knocked me to the ground and everything. So um like that whole vertical um, and horizontal movement from those rally waves, like that's a thing. It happens. OK, um, if you don't you know, want to take my word for it, Hollywood actually made a movie called San Andreas and you can watch that. And they've got like their little like spin on how those waves can wreak havoc in places like L.A. and San Francisco. Um, anyway, so here's a little map on um, divergent and subduction zones just to kind of give you some quote unquote hot spots for earthquakes. And um and when you think about these divergent and subduction zones, uh, I want you to just kind of take a quick peek right here along the coast of California. And you can kind of see that this Pacific plate is moving um, upward and out. And this North American plate is kind of going in, right? And um, will eventually turn and go down. And so that's where we get that side to side movement along the, the San Andreas Fault. A um, little bit closer look is uh, right here through this slide. And it shows you the San Andreas Fault, which kind of skirts the coastline of California or the western edge of California. Um, if you've ever been over to the beach, you've traveled down Highway 41 through the mountains, um, pay attention as you look out the window and you will actually see, um, as you travel through places like Hollister and whatnot, um, the San Andreas Fault. I mean, it's there. It's at the surface. And there's some very distinct markings that go along with it. Um, the San Andreas Fault is creeping along at about the same pace that your fingernails grow at. So like literally maybe about two centimeters a year. OK, as the rock pushes against each other, it's not smooth and slick. So it's not just this nice little like flowing movement. Um, the rock actually sticks and um, grinds into uh, you know, one plate to the next. And then will eventually like as pressure builds up, it'll pop. And as it pops, that's when we get the, the release of massive amounts of energy and uh, the subsequent earthquake that follows. Okay, From here, we're going to look at volcanoes. Uh, volcanoes uh, also tend to happen along the edges of our um, Pacific and North American plates um, and places where you have subduction. The Pacific plate, in the case of the border that I just mentioned, is diving under the North American plate. And as it goes under, it's melting. While melting, that magma comes up to the surface, finds a weak spot in the continental plate, and literally burns through and makes a volcano. Um, that's usually how volcanoes form. However, there are a couple of exceptions you need to note. One right here, and there's a slide later on to show you more detail on it. That's the Hawaiian hotspot. Um, in that case, there's no like border anywhere near Hawaii. So how did that happen? Well, long story short, um, the magma in the mantle found a weak spot in the oceanic plate and literally burned through. And as it burned through, it made the Hawaiian Islands. OK, another area that is kind of an exception to the rule is over here. If you're not a fan of geography, then you don't know that that is Iceland. Iceland's actually on the border of the two plates moving away from each other. So it's actually a divergent zone, yet there's lots of volcanic activity. Um, and Iceland's actually kind of cool. They have a bridge where you could literally walk from like the North American plate to the Eurasian plate over the trench that um, separates the two. So you just like, doo -doo -doo -doo, I'm in Asia. And then doo -doo -doo -doo, I'm in North America. Like, wow. Um, but because those plates are moving apart, there's all kinds of magma that comes to the surface and creates ridges uh, along the edges. And along those ridges, you have lots 
of volcanic activity, so much so that Iceland's actually harnessed that um, volcanic activity in the form of geothermal energy. And uh, they're pretty much 100% fossil fuel free as a result, right? That's pretty cool. Um, this is the Hawaiian hotspot that I mentioned a while ago. So you can see that um, basically the magma from the mantle found a weak spot, burned through the crust and created the Hawaiian islands. As the uh, plate continues to move, the um, hot spot moves, and that's why we have an island chain and not just one big Hawaiian island, okay? Um, volcanoes, a couple other little facts about them. Um, you know, volcanoes and undersea magma vents are the ultimate source for the Earth's crust. Um, basically, you know, if you think about uh, the history of the Earth, you know, um, the, the volcanic eruptions threw all this stuff out into the air, and also uh, brought magma to the surface and it just sort of like spread out and created that crust. Uh, many of the world's fertile soils are really just, you know, weathered volcanic material. Um, probably the most deadly and dangerous things that we think about when we think about volcanoes um, are like the pyroclastic clouds that come with them or mudslides. Those pyroclastic clouds are called nus ardentes, okay? Um, it's a deadly cloud of hot gas and ash that, you know, basically destroys everything in its path. And it's one of those that we think actually destroyed the town of Pompeii. If you're not familiar with the town of Pompeii, then you need to watch the movie Night at the Museum and see what happened to poor little cowboy and his buddy. Um, and maybe then you'll understand what happened in Pompeii. But um, Pompeii was not blanketed with like lava. Um, if it were, then the structures that are still standing now and, and that have been unearthed wouldn't exist. They would have been destroyed. Um, in the town of Pompeii, a gaseous pyroclastic cloud came down from Mount Vesuvius at temperatures exceeding 1,000 degrees centigrade and 60 miles an hour and basically um, fossilized everything in its path. Mudslides are also pretty dangerous. Probably the most famous volcanic eruption here in the U.S. was Mount St. Helens, which happened a couple of decades ago now. Um, and basically, uh, in with Mount St. Helens, the most deadly thing or part of that volcanic eruption wasn't the stuff that went up. It was the stuff that went out to the side. When the mountain um, blew up or erupted, uh, it was completely covered with like glacial snow and ice. And uh, the volcanic eruption melted all that, slid the side of the mountain off, and the mudslide wiped out the surrounding community. Okay. Um, volcanic dust and sulfur emissions can also create almost like a nuclear winter on a global scale. Some people talk about the idea of Yellowstone being a super volcano and that one day it will erupt. If that were to happen, um, that literally would be a cataclysmic, um, you know, world or global event because um, while Yellowstone is here in the United States, the cauldron for that um, volcano is literally miles across. And if it went up, it would throw enough smoke, ash, sulfur emissions into the atmosphere to literally blanket the entire atmosphere of the earth for weeks, months before it would let up. And if that happened, plant life would stop photosynthesizing because you wouldn't have, you know, sunlight and stuff like that. We'd be in big trouble. Okay. Um, this just kind of give you a picture of what it looks like, you know, after a volcanic eruption when it comes to like smoke and ash and all that kind of good stuff. Um, landslides, okay, another geologic hazard. Uh, when you think about landslides, landslides, again, you kind of think about the mudslides that came with Mount St. Helens, but um, this is just basic landslides that occur as a result of the normal weathering process. Um, in today's California, lots of people want that awesome view. So they go build their house like right on the edge of like a cliff or something. And they're like, yeah, I got the view. But then they get mad, you know, when it starts raining and all the surrounding soil around the base of their house just goes whoop and their house goes right down the cliff. Okay. Um, landslides are examples of mass wasting, as it's called, in which geologic materials are basically moved down slope under the influence of gravity, right? Water gets into the substrata, um, loosens it, and it just slides right downhill, right? Can be slowed, um, you know, if you plant proper vegetation to hold things in place, stuff like that. Um, the wasting itself can occur slow, it could be subtle, or it could just be like, bam, like, and you know, there goes your house, okay? 
road construction, forest clearing, cultivation, building on steep, unstable slopes all increase the possibility of damage by landslides. Um, this is an example, okay? Um, a landslide of the Pacific Palisades in California. So all these people built their houses all along the coastal, um, you know, like edge. And just from normal wave action, water washed in and undercut the, the cliff face and down came the houses. All right, gang. So that's just a few things on geologic hazards that should wrap up this portion of our notes on Earth systems. We'll be back with another installment as we start talking about the oceans. See you then.